Next, we have Michael Shaw Money XL Clairvaux. Now, Shaw Money was the uh, was a, a producer for 50 Cent. He was the the, the business manager for G Unit. He produced many songs. Uh, he um, he was the vice president of AR for Def Jams in, uh, in, uh, in May 2010. He produced a lot of different music. Uh, he was a, a business executive and a executive for many different uh, labels. Um, yep. Uh, um, and the way I know him, we went to grade school together. Right? We went to St. Joe Man together. And he was, his family was the. All right, all right, enough music. I love the music, though. Music. But, but his family, right, owned the Beef Patty place on 212. And, uh, and and Jamaica, and they still do. We have some of the patties from his, from the, the family restaurant. Yes. Thank you. So, Sha, first of all, it's been hard to get this brother. And let me tell you something about him. Now, Sha Money XL is a guy that um, I've admired for years. Now, um, and I haven't seen him in a while because you know he's working at he's he's bi coastal. He's in L.A. Well, he's everywhere. But, but he had a house in L.A. and spent a lot of time in L.A. And, and I haven't seen him in, in years. So one day before I go to work, since I think I was working for you at the time. But one day before I go to work, I go get my, early in the morning, I go get my Haitian beef patty and something called Akasan, this, this heavy cornmeal drink. Don't drink it if you're lactose intolerant. I'm, I'm just keeping it real. I go there and I see somebody behind the counter and it's, Multi-millionaire music mogul Shaw Money XL. His mother telling him, "Go get this, go get that, da 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 da." <laughs> so Shaw, first of all, um, you were, uh, and a lot of us, I see a lot of people here that I went to school with that are in the music business um, and trying to get back to the music business. You got into the business side of it, young. Explain that to me. How? Uh, getting into the business side, I went to school. I went to NYU, and uh, I was taught marketing and business in NYU, and that's where I started to learn uh, about business, as well as the fact that I always worked at the bakery since I was about 10 years old. So all I knew... Wait, that's child labor. Problem, <laughs> For real, you worked to 10? Well, hey, my mother couldn't pay everybody, so... <laughs> She found a way to catch some shortcuts and expand the business. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, I started working early and seeing how the business worked. And as well as, you know, she, as you know, always wanted us to have a good education. So I made sure I went to college. And when I went to NYU, that's when my real spark started. And I seen things that I didn't see within my community what I was able to learn in school, you know. So that's where I got my start. So, so how do you, so when you're in the, you know, you're a young guy doing the business management for such a big, powerful record brand. What, what is that like? I mean, what, what, you know, what, what kind of thing did you do? What kind of thing did you learn, right? You went from, you know, uh, you know working on, on, on patties and, 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 and food to, this, this, to hip hop, this global thing. What was that like? Well, I mean, growing up in a Haitian household, you, you know, you got school is first, then they give you something to do academically away from that, like a sport or an instrument. And my mother, my father wanted me to play soccer. I had no skills. So um, my mother took me to piano school. And um, from that, I learned the piano. And uh, as I learned the piano, as I got older, I started realizing what was going on in the music. And I was like, wait a second, that's this chord, that's this note. And I understood what the actual music was doing. And from that, it turned me into a producer. Wow. So with that, I started uh, at 16 years old making beats, and I would go around my whole neighborhood trying to produce for everybody. And uh, one guy I stumbled over when I was 18 was 50 Cent. Wow. Uh, we're both from Queens. Uh, we met each other through Jam Master J, rest in peace. And uh, he mentored me and 50 how to make it into the music business by making music as well as handling business. And I was more of the responsible one out of both of us. And um, that, that led him to trust me. And with trust, I was able to have conversations on a higher level with other people within the industry on his behalf. 
And with that, that's what gave me the business and the management and the responsibility to take over, you know, the company and, you know, do what we had to do. So, so you're a young guy in your early 20s running a multi-million dollar corporation. That's what it is, right? Running a multi-million dollar corporation. Um, one thing I was saying before was when I, when I go to that, to the, your, your mother's store um, and your family's store, your mother handles money all the time. Right? She, right? Yeah, am I lying to you? Uh, she, um, and then she coordinates, everybody's working, she coordinates. What did you learn from, what business did you, what, how, what kind of business uh, lessons did you learn from your family business as opposed to what you learned from college? And did, did college prepare you for the business world? What I really learned is the owner has to be the operator. Um, my mother did handle the money because before, in 1988, when she first opened, she couldn't afford to just work there. So she still worked at Drake's Bakery, wow. owning her skills in baking. Wow. And with that, she would go to work and come back and there's flour missing. Wow. <laughs> Somebody's taking bags of flour. They're like $15 a piece. The whole inventory is gone. So they were stealing. And then with that, she said, you know what? She looked at my father, who was an entrepreneur. He was always, my father never had a job. So with that, I seen his economic freedom. He was always able to create his own schedule and do what he needed to do and be around us when we needed him there. So with that, she um, left her job and he was the one that was mainly providing and took the chance and stood at her, her business day in, day out for the last 30 years. And with that, the business flourished because you're the owner and the operator. Your heart is in it. You're not gonna steal from yourself. You're gonna build with yourself. And she taught us that, and that's what we did. We was there with her, standing side by side, investing in the home. So, we you know, it's interesting. I'm going to talk about legacy. I'm going to go, and I'm going to delve into that and go deep into that. Um, so, in the music business, how did that translate for you in the music business, seeing that in your, in your, in your in learning that from your mom? First thing that kept the business alive is customer service, right? <laughs> Having reoccurring customers, people that you adopt and become community and family with, right? So um, with that, I was able to know that this is an industry. You have to make friends and be able to have that same network. And with that, I was the one that wasn't, you know, I was fostering communities and building relationships that got us from where we started to meeting Chris Lighty. And with that, you know, Chris Lighty was able to come help me and co-manage 50 and take us to another level. So it just helped me understand the strength and network. Your net worth is your network. You know what I'm saying? So you have your net worth is your network. You know what I'm saying? So you have to know the right people and you have to be able to keep that, that relationship ongoing and not burn those bridges. So as I was building, interning as well, working for free at Def Jam, um, at, through college, I wouldn't have gotten to Def Jam without college. So school is very important in this. I will never take that away. I did graduate college, but school was very important. Um, I see my dreams start to happen as I got to Def Jam, and I kind of leaned more towards that, and Jam Master J pulled me in. And with that, I was able to meet all these guys. And uh, like I said, Chris Lighty was one of them I met in my journey, and he was a strong part of my career and how we grew in this industry because he was already established and he helped take us to the next level. So, Sha, I'm going to be a little bit ignorant, but I got to, I got to, I got to ask this question. Um, so, I see the music business and 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 you in, in the videos, and it's a it's a it's a high sexy business. You got you're around beautiful people, all this kind of stuff. It's fun. What would make you want to go back to the bakery? Ownership. My mother started a legacy, and I don't want it to end with just what she did. We want it to continue so I can pass it to my kids, my nieces, and my nephews, my siblings as well. So, And she installed that in us. So we wasn't trying to let something. She's getting in her old age. She can't be standing there every day. And I'm not going to watch my mother die of work. So I stepped in to, to alleviate that so she can relax and live her life and enjoy it now because she worked her whole life for us. So that's what it's about. Um, you know, I grew up, I remember there was a black deli, right? And I always looked at that like, wow, this, most of the delis is Arab and Spanish. This is a black deli. And then that guy passed it to his son and it was, it continued on. 
So that was always in my head early. And I said that, you know, my mother's building something and she's gonna, she's gonna need us to take it to the next level. And that's what I'm doing now, you know, putting the, the patties in supermarkets, you know, uh, we'll be the first Haitian to feed patties and chicken and all kind of flavors in supermarkets. So expanding the business as well, not just keeping it where it was, but also taking it to another level. And that's, that's pretty much it. So there are, now again, uh, this, these conversations are for different people in different places. There are people whose parents have businesses, and there are people that, whose parents have, uh, you know, black-owned businesses, but the next generation doesn't take the mantle, doesn't, you know, pick it up, and allows that business to die or atrophy. Um, what would you tell that person? What would you, what, I mean, what would you say, what was your message to, the, to those folks? I want to start off by saying this to, to you know, add to what I was saying earlier. I worked for a record label. I was uh, one of the youngest and only black executives in the company. That record label I didn't own. Mm -hmm. All right? I was working my ass off for that label. I watched that label make millions and millions of dollars. But I didn't own it. And half of the brothers that did own their labels, they sold it back to the companies. Wow. Right? So here I am watching us. You know, we're able and we're blessed. With, wow. You can't turn that blessing into a curse. Now you're selling your assets. Wow. Without assets, you have nothing to pass on. Wow. So I'm looking at the future. and What am I going to pass on to my daughters and my son? What are my nieces and nephews going to have? They're going to have this business. I was blessed to be able to be mentored by Lowell Hawthorne, who owns Golden Cross. Yes. He's at 127 stores, wow. right? Wow. He's in public schools. He's in even feeding the jails. So, And he's feeding his whole family and a, a bunch of black people that are able to work for him, right? And that's what I want to do. You know, that's, that's, the, the, you know, I can't do that, it, you know, work for a record label. So that's what the whole game is about. All right, so this is one thing that is hard to quantify. What, what's the drive? What drives you? What, you know, what, what, what makes you get up every day and, and do that and, and, and build, build that? Because it's easy, you know, you, part of what the blessing that you and, uh, and Proz have is you have residual income. You guys have, you know, they get Unfortunately, these guys get royalties off of copyrights that come in quarterly. That's a blessing, right? So you don't have to do this. What, what drives you? My family. That's my main drive. And um, seeing that I can pass something to them so they don't have to start from scratch. They can start from somewhere, and that's my main thing to do. Leave that legacy so when it's passed down, it's going to continue, and they'll build it up. That's my main thing. But how? What made you do that? Well, I mean, it started with my mother. I see what she did for us. So it's like you got to pass that on. You can't let it die. You got to let that live on. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to keep doing that so the next generation is able to do that for the next. Now, one thing I want to ask you about investment, because you also invest in other things and you've also, uh, you know, you also still have, you're still also still in the music industry. You also still have your in, in entertainment. Um, Explain that to me. How do you invest in yourself on those on that level and, and, and building that also? It's called catalog. So I have a catalog of publishing and royalties from records that I produce and uh, songs that I write. And with those, it gets transferred. Those don't die when I die. So you have someone like Marvin Gaye, whose kids just made five million from Pharrell for a lawsuit of something their father owned. That was his copyright. So this is what I'm working for, a bunch of copyrights and, and catalog that I can pass on and just have that as an asset. And that's a strong asset to have to pass on because it never dies. It passes on to the next. So that's what I'm doing it for. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, Shaw Money XL.